Welcome, Bishop. How are you? Thank you, Ron. Welcome to you. Glad you're still with us. Yeah, well, I'm and glad our. What do you mean, glad I'm still with you? What, what is that? I'm glad you didn't go back to some warm place. <laughs> I mean, I just got back last week. Yeah, but I mean, you know, yeah. you're away so much. We're, well, we're happy not, you're with I, us. I, I, I've had, teasing you, of course. I've had people teasing me, and some of them are saying it was a refreshing time. Not to, they said it was a refreshing break not to have to listen to. Me. I don't know about that. I, they thought you left the show. No, we, some you were said, gone so long. Some said it's good to have a real professional with you as opposed <laughs> to somebody like me. Well, we know the other Ron is always <laughs> is always welcome, and we're grateful. Oh, absolutely. I'm I appreciate him sitting. In front of me. <laughs> and thanks to our viewers and listeners for tuning in and watching again here in this Lenten time, our Bishop's Corner. And what a what a blessing and a grace to be able to continue to thank you for your prayers and support regarding my recent full hip replacement surgery. And one of the things, uh, Ron, I, I, I would just share, uh, it, it was a lesson for me in vulnerability. So just two things I would comment on. One is, of course, first, of course, you start on a walker, and then you graduate from the walker to the cane, and then you graduate to walking on your own. So it's a really slow and, and deliberate process to come back to you know full health in that regard. But I have to tell you, one of the reflections I had, which was very significant for me, was being vulnerable and simply having to, to literally surrender to the care of others. And you put your hands in the hands of a surgeon, in the hands of nurses and caretakers, of folks who are doing your physical therapy, and it's really a vulnerable position. Yeah. And I, it, I reflected that it was kind of, it was kind of something that taught me greater vulnerability before the Lord, that we have to surrender to him. And one of the prayers that uh, sort of came to me was a prayer I'd been praying all Lent. It's, and you know how I love threes. And it was simply, I adore you, I love you, I surrender. And so in that way, my Lenten prayer has taken a different shape. And then another one, just a note on my uh, recovery uh, as Lent began, you know, I had this surgery, Ron, and my very dear priest friend of mine said, now listen to me. And I said, oh, here it comes. And he said, your Lent is before you and the virtue is patience. Mm. And I thought, wow, that struck me right between the eyes because I don't need to look further in a sense for Lent because in many ways Lent is provided in recovery. And of course, being someone who is not very patient with himself regarding things like that, that I would have to grow in the virtue of patience this Lent. Mm. So there's my little reflection on surgery and Lent. <laughs> uh, I, I think you needed to learn the patience. Just, just I absolutely you know, I, 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 mean, just I need to learn that, it all the time, you know, Ron. I need to learn more and more. Don't we all? And plus I need to learn humility. I well, yeah, say. well don't we all? What's on your schedule? <laughs> so if, if I'm able to do it, do. exactly, if by God's grace my physical condition allows me to do it, I'm looking forward to a mass with confirmation on Saturday, March twenty sixth at St. Augustine in Napoleon. That's at eleven. On Tuesday, March 29th, looking forward to uh, sitting with the Deacon Council, which I meet regularly with when they do their meetings throughout the year. I think it's four times a year. Uh, Wednesday, the 30th, can you believe it? We have another Annunciation radio taping. Mm -hmm. And then Thursday, the 31st, I'll be having uh, getting together with all those wonderful lay people from our diocese and one priest who generously give up their time and talent to be members of our Diocesan Finance Council and to counsel me in all things financial, which is a great gift to our diocese. So thanks to those good folks. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, let's go to a recent gospel from Luke from the third Sunday of Lent. Thank you. And folks, just so you're aware, this is year C. Some parishes might do year A, but we're in year C. All right. A is permitted, but we're sticking with year C. <laughs> <laughs> Some people told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. Jesus said to them in reply, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were greater sinners than all other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. As he told them this parable, there once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard, and when he came in search of fruit on it but found none, he said to the gardener, For three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree, but have found none, so cut it down. 
why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. Your thoughts, Bishop? Folks, this gospel, of course, again, year C, the gospel of Luke, there is the option, however, to go to year A, and I'm saying this now so that I don't get the questions next week. Why in my parish did we not do that gospel that you talked about? Because it's a legitimate option, so just so you're aware. But sticking with year C, this gospel, of course, from St. Luke, points out this understanding, of course, of the Jewish people that in many ways it was saying that because of their ancestors or because of their heritage or because of something, some tragedy that befell them, that was an indication of their sinfulness. And of course, Jesus is trying to say to them, but the real the realization is that whether you are guilty of sin, and I tell you, if you don't repent, you will perish. So, so, so much of this, dear folks, has to do with repentance. And that's a theme of Lent, isn't it? And isn't it fascinating? You know, I was at a retreat one time and I was so struck where the retreat deck director kept going back again and again to saying, what were the very first words of Jesus in the gospel? Repent and believe in the good news. Well, if we have nothing to repent of, well then, you know, life is hunky-dory. But obviously, if we're honest with ourselves, we do. And that's what Lent is all about. That we recognize in ourselves what we need to repent of to do that repentance and to trust that as a result, we will not perish. And I think that uh, parable is a wonderful one. You know, Jesus, it, it's added here from St. Luke. He uses this parable of the fig tree with which we're familiar. And Jesus sees this tree that has no fruit. Well, obviously it's a tree that should have fruit at that time of year. And clearly for three years, I've come in search of fruit, but I found none. So cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? And he says to, obviously, the master, well, no, just give it a year and let me cultivate it, fertilize around it, and let's see if it bears fruit again. That's what repentance is. It's the cultivation and this fertilizing of our lives so that we might recognize our sins, turn away from them in honesty, and intentionally make every effort not to sin again and stand against temptation so that we might bear the good fruit because he's made us to bear his good fruit. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. Bishop, let's get one in here. Can you, can you fit in a question? I think we can. Then good. We're going to go to Todd and Napoleon. Thank you, Todd. Says, Dear Bishop Thomas, has the church ever changed its teaching on faith and morals? I'm thinking about a funeral mass for a victim of suicide, which didn't used to be permitted, but now is. Has teaching ever evolved? And if so, did the Holy Spirit act in two different ways of informing teaching? Thanks, Todd. Thank you so much, Todd, and I appreciate your writing. And maybe I could answer it first by saying this. The church's teaching on faith and morals, we know, is set by the church from the gospel and from Jesus. So, obviously, if you go to any of the Code of Canon Law 749 and on. It talks all about how we understand the church's faith, morals, and doctrine and dogma. But you ask an interesting question, and maybe I can help by answering it directly. You say here, well, I'm thinking about a funeral mass for a victim of suicide. Well, you use an interesting, I'm not sure what a victim of suicide is. I presume you mean a person who commits suicide because that's what suicide is, someone taking their own life. They are their own victims. Maybe that's what you're thinking. But the reality is that the teaching of the church has never changed. That is, that to take one's life is wrong. So if I take another's life or if I take my life, it is morally wrong. That's the clear teaching of the church. That hasn't changed. What did change was the understanding of the liturgy that there may be through the liturgy, the possibility of mercy for that person, because if they did commit suicide, it may have been they were not in their right mind. It may have been there was undue coercion from others that caused them to take their own life. 
So there are factors that would perhaps permit the reality that we entrust the person, even if they committed suicide, to the mercy of the Lord, for it is his to judge, not for us. So I hope that's clear, the principle of the reality of life and the teaching of the church in life has never changed. But the application and the liturgical understanding of what could or could not be permitted certainly can be adjusted. You may want to, Todd, go to John, St. John Henry Newman, who wrote all about the development of doctrine. And the church has accepted, because obviously he was so brilliant, has accepted very much his understanding that doctrine can develop in certain ways, but there's also the doctrine that we understand is fixed. And taking one's life or the life of another is fixed, obviously. All right. Thank you, Bishop. We've got to take a quick Thank break, you, Todd. folks. Uh, okay. A lot of questions to get to. Don't go anywhere. And the Bishop has a lot of answers, I hope. <laughs> so we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we're back here at the Bishop's Corner. Uh, Bishop Welcome da- back, folks. Bishop Daniel Thomas is always eager to uh, answer your questions, folks. There's uh, several different ways you can do that. You can go to the website or the uh, mobile app. You can also email your questions to bishop at annunciationradio.com. Uh, we do ask maybe you give us your first name, the town you're from, something like that, so the bishop has some idea who he's speaking with. Uh, we do get a lot of questions, folks, and sometimes we don't get to them all, but if you... Keep listening. Uh, every show, you'll probably get to hear your question at some point. And Bishop, we're going to go to Becky at Our Lady of Lords in Genoa. Thank you, Becky, for writing in. It says, Dear Bishop Thomas, on Ash Wednesday, we receive ashes on our forehead. Somebody told me that we are the only country that does this. Other countries sprinkle them on, sprinkle them on top of the head. Do you know why we do it this way? I think this is a great way to get people asking about our (laughs) wonderful religion and beliefs. Thank you, Becky. Thanks, Becky. So there are a lot of folks, and I appreciate the question, of course. I think we've gotten this question in Lent before. And it's interesting, you know, we know that one of the Gospels of Lent says, when you fast or when you pray, you know, go to your room, close your door, don't let anyone see it or wash your face and comb your hair so that people don't recognize it. So then other people have the exact opposite impression. Why do we put those ashes on the forehead? So it's like a screaming indication. (laughs) Here I am, I'm a Catholic. But I think you bring up something. In a sense, there's an evangelical uh, tool to it. And I can tell you, I watched a uh, a news outlet where the reporter was sitting with ashes on their forehead on Ash Wednesday. And it, you know, it really is actually a wonderful outward sign of witness to the Catholic faith. So I would tend to agree with you in that last section. And Becky, you know, I'm left-handed, so I start at the end. <laughs> but your question about, uh, are we the only ones who do it? Other countries sprinkle them on the top of the head. You may or may not remember that during COVID world, some people were very concerned about imposing ashes on the forehead and any kind of touch. And therefore, in some places, they were, in fact, sprinkled on the on the top or the crown of the head. Uh, Father Edward McNamara, who's a legionary of Christ, <clears throat> pardon me, he gives some great answers to questions like this. So this is really from him. Ashes were imposed on men on the crown of their head. But in his research, he found out that on women, they were imposed for a time on the forehead because they had their heads covered. Isn't that interesting? Mm, yeah. And their heads were covered. <coughs> Pardon me. So in most English-speaking countries, I can tell you the prevailing custom is that the, the priest places holy water. You might remember seeing it on Ash Wednesday. The ashes are sprinkled with holy water first, which also means that they become a kind of paste. It's not just dust. So in that paste, they're able to place the form of a cross on the forehead, and that's why it remains. It's kind of like a a pasty ashes because holy water is added to it. Now, in some places, for example, in many European countries, Italy, where I lived, you know, for many, many years, it's very much the ashes without, if you will, an amount of holy water. 
so that it really is like dust. And then that fulfills, you know, some of the language of one of the forms that can be used on Ash Wednesday. Remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. And the ashes are sprinkled on the crown of the head as they have been, for example, on the Holy Father for centuries. So I think it's a matter of the manner in which the local bishops conference permit it. And in either case, it's a sign of repentance. So turn away from sin and believe in the gospel. So in both ways, that is captured by the imposition of ashes on Ash Wednesday. Okay. Thanks, Becky. Good. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, we're going to go to Sue at St. Joe's in Sylvania. Uh, Thank you, Sue. Dear Bishop, my question is the same as always this time of year. Uh, Girl Scout cookie sales should be banned to sell in our diocese. Why aren't they? Indirectly, the National's Girl Scouts support abortion in many ways. They have in the past five years hidden cash that they pledge, but openly support and teach young girls that abortion is their right. Girl Scout troops make very little money selling cookies. There are many other things that can be done to fund, fund a troop. My troop did not sell cookies. We did many things that we supported our parish. Thank you, Bishop, for thinking more about this issue. Thanks, Sue. Sue, thank you for writing in from St. Joe's in Sylvania. And I guess, Sue, you know, I, I rarely try to uh, contradict the recommendation of my sixth grade teacher, Sister Joanna Marie Rader, who taught us never answer a question with a question. But sometimes I break that rule. You ask, why are we permitting the sale of cookies if, in fact, Girl Scouts support abortion and all these other negative things? And then you say, my troop didn't sell cookies. My question to you would be, why are you a troop leader of Girl Scouts if the Girl Scouts themselves are so given to things which are contradictory to the church? So before we even get to the question of whether or not Girl Scouts could sell those cookies, and I am not condemning little girls who sell cookies, but I'm asking you, Sue, why would you raise the question of selling cookies if you yourself are a scout troop leader and the troops follow the Girl Scouts national policy, which is blatantly against the church? That's a question to you, Sue. Then I would have to say, obviously, I know parishes in our diocese, Sue, who, in fact, do not have Girl Scouts. When it came clear that Girl Scouts were changing their policies, I know parishes which changed to heritage girls and other such groups for young women. And I know parishes who do not permit the sale of Girl Scout cookies, and that it is a source of great contention. So, Pulling back from that question of great contention, I would ask you the counter question, because it precedes whether or not they could sell cookies. I wonder, why would you be involved with a group that, in fact, supports abortion and other things that are totally contradictory to the church? Thanks, Sue. Good. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Jason, St. John uh, the 23rd in Perrysburg. Uh, Dear Bishop Thomas, what resources do you recommend for teaching objective morality to high school age young adults? Thanks, Jason. Thanks so much, Jason, for writing in from St. John the 23rd Parish. And your question, of course, is significant. What do I recommend for teaching objective morality to high school age young adults? So I don't know, Jason, if you're involved in that teaching, if you are, blessed be God. But certainly, I think you know, you can check with some of our Catholic high schools and the resources that they use, but I can share with you from our catechetical office here at the Pastoral Center, I offer these few recommendations. There's a, actually a new book by Matthew Minard from Ascension Press entitled Made by God, Made for God, colon, Catholic Morality Explained. And that appears to be a very, very, very good new, if you will, or newer resource about Catholic morality seen, obviously, in the light of where we are at the present. Uh, there are video series, Jason, that you can do. Uh, one is You, Y-O-U, Life, Love, and the Theology of the Body. That's by Brian Butler and Jason, imagine that, Jason and Kristalina Evert. Obviously, Jason Evert is very popular as an evangelist. Also, UCAT.org. UCAT stands for the Faith of the Catholic Church, vividly explained, innovatively presented, and officially confirmed. Fundamentally, it's the Catechism of the Catholic Church for Adolescents and Young People. It's called UCAT. 
basically youth catechism. And then, of course, anything from the theology of the body from Jason Everett and Christopher West. And you can find many of these resources as well on Formed, which is the platform that the diocese provides to all our parishes, which includes teaching on morality. So thanks for your interest. And I can't think of, God knows there are so many important topics, but teaching objective, and good for you for using that word, Jason, objective Catholic morality to our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Let's get one more in here. Thank Um, you. Bishop, this is an anonymous question, which we usually don't take, but it's... uh, it's about Lent, so okay. I think we're going to go ahead and put it in. Dear Bishop Thomas, uh, Lent, the season of repentance, is a time to prepare ourselves for our risen Lord. Uh, why then do parishes refuse to baptize newborns during this season? In my opinion, it seems like a clerical and worldly era of red tape. Uh, where overcommitted clergy during this busy season prevent newborns from entering the church, therefore allowing the child to live with original sin longer than necessary. Who then is responsible for the state of the child's soul if something were to happen? If we firmly believe in God's grace as received during the sacrament of baptism, which we do, then every infant should be baptized as soon as possible, regardless of the parish calendar. Thank you, Bishop, and God bless. Thank you for your question. Obviously, I don't know to whom I'm responding or where you are, but I can tell you this. I agree completely with your last sentence. Every infant should be baptized as soon as possible, regardless of the parish calendar. Why do I say that? All you need to do is know that there is no church or liturgical law that prohibits baptisms during Lent. This comes up in Lent over and over and again, and a fair number of the parishes apparently choose not to do baptisms for whatever reason. But baptism is not to be denied. And it's very clear the Catechism of the Catholic Church says infants should be baptized shortly after birth, number 1250. And Canon 867 is even more specific, noting parents are obliged to take care that infants are baptized in the first few weeks after birth. So I hope you understand that shortly and few weeks are seen by some pastors as an opportunity maybe to wait to the Easter season once Lent has begun. Certainly an an infant in danger of death should, of course, be baptized immediately. But I would suggest that you, and I don't know of whom or where you're speaking, but that you speak to the pastor, because I know there are some parishes which have had that as a custom, but if the parents wish their child baptized, the, the pastor is perfectly happy to baptize that child when they want them baptized. Obviously, you would not postpone the baptism of a child who was ill or gravely ill if they're healthy. But I agree with you. And, you know, the law of the church says baptism necessary for salvation is the sign and means of God's prevenient love, frees us from original sin, communicates to us a share in divine life. And this is from the 1980 instruction of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. It says, as to the time for the celebration, the first consideration is the welfare of the child, that it may not be deprived of the benefit of the sacrament. Then the health of the mother must be considered so that as as far as possible, she too may be present. Then, as long as they do not interfere with the greater good of the child, pastoral considerations as allowing sufficient time to prepare the parents for the planning should be taken into consideration. Accordingly, if the child is in danger of death, it is to be baptized without delay. Otherwise, as a rule, quote, an infant should be baptized within the first weeks after birth. So please understand that's as clear as a bell as what the church teaches and holds. All right. Thank Thank you, you, Bishop. We are out of time. Oh, my word. Yeah, could we get... How is it possible, Ron? I don't know. And we were just getting going. I was getting (laughs) revved up there. Could we get a prayer and a blessing? Surely. So let's pray the collect or the opening prayer, folks, from obviously the Mass from which we took the Gospel, the third Sunday of Lent. Let us pray. O God, author of every mercy and of all goodness, who, in fasting prayer and almsgiving, have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness, that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, 
forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. And Ron, what a great line that we who are bowed down by our conscience may be lifted up by his mercy. Amen. I hope you're lifted up by his mercy this week, folks. So glad you're with us on the Bishop's Corner. Thank we'll you. See you again right here next week, folks, at the Bishop's Corner.